Hi, welcome. My name is Scott Kopetz. I'm an associate professor from MD Anderson Cancer Center, and I'm here joined by Axel Grothy, professor of uh, medical oncology from Mayo and Rochester. Um, we're here to discuss key insights uh, from the Great Debates Conference and GI malignancies, and really excited to hear uh, some of the thoughts and, and insights on what is going to be the most practice changing, what are some of the key takeaway points, especially ones that we think are clinically relevant, where we'll be able to really change how we manage our patients with GI malignancies. So, Axel, yeah, thank you. Scott. Welcome. Uh, I'm uh, curious on your, your thoughts about the conference, and uh, especially in the area of, uh, of colorectal cancer, where I think we heard a fair bit of discussion about the role of different subtypes of colon cancer, uh, touched on left and right colon yep. cancer biology. Uh, we heard about novel technologies like circulating tumor DNA, update on hereditary monitoring, and even aspirin use. So <laughs> a lot of information. What was the uh, most practice changing uh, areas of discussion and debate uh, in the colorectal session in your opinion? think for most relevant for clinical practice right now is how to integrate all the markers that you mentioned, molecular marker, sightedness marker, you know, in the complex treatment approach for patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. We mainly talked about metastatic, not early stage uh, colorectal cancer. And I think it has, uh, I can imagine it has to be confusing for someone who's not really in the field, you know. We adopted KRAS, exon 2 mutation testing as a negative predictive marker for EGF receptor antibodies, then we expanded the KRAS testing to, let's say, KRAS and RAS, uh, exon 2, 3, 4 testing. BRAF came around, now we're talking about HER2. Then uh, all of a sudden everything gets trumped by this sidedness question, right versus left colon, which uh, threw us a kind of a curveball because, you know, who would have thought that left and right sided colon would be so different? And so integrating all this in, uh, into a treatment pattern is not that easy. Now we had uh, the fun part here at this conference are the debates, the, because we put people into a, a kind of pro and con situation and we ex say, okay, left-sided colon cancer, is it mandatory to use egf septa antibodies or can you use bevacizumab? So I think that's the fun part of the debate. And I think we learned a lot also from people asking about cases, et cetera. So if you ask me about, you know, what's the takeaway right now, I think, you know, the NCCN guidelines that were recently updated, including markers and sightedness, I think they've been validated by uh, the discussion that we had. And uh, it might sometimes take some time to really mull over some of the things. And uh, I think we're, in terms of EGF septic antibody versus anti-VEGF therapy in first line, we have a pretty solid understanding that no EGF septa antibody should not be used in RAS mutant tumors. No EGF septa antibody should not be used in right sided tumors. And very likely they should not, at least by themselves, not used in, uh, in BRAF mutant tumors, although it's still considered one of the standards of care. I mean, that is also kind of based on your study, because you, we presented some data of your study, which kind of moved uh, the treatment approach for the BRAF V600E mutant tumors forward. You, you added vemurafenib <laughs> to our treatment. That, that's right, and I think uh, that's been one of the areas that we've recognized that, uh, as you mentioned, in patients that have uh, mutation in BRAF oncogene, the EGFR inhibition is not uh, useful uh, by itself as we would like. But what we do see is that when, when you give that in combination with a BRAF inhibitor, that that EGFR feedback is very critical to the biology of the tumor. So the combination does things way beyond the individual agents. So there's, yep. there's hope. Uh, That's actually a fun, of my, my fun takeaway from the last couple of months is that if you have a good understanding about molecular biology and have the right preclinical setup, you can actually design rational clinical trials and see the expected result. Doesn't always happen this way, but in this case kind of using a BRAF inhibitor like the Morafenib and using it in conjunction with egf septa antibody, blocking a feedback loop. I think this is really interesting and I do believe at some point we'll make it part of our clinical practice. Yeah. And, uh, and this is, was 
part of the discussion when we talked about right-sided and left-sided. And there had been some thought, well, maybe this right-sided tumor biology is just the BRAF or MSI high. What, what was your takeaway from the discussion? You know, I mean, you gave a very elegant presentation about, you know, what could be the molecular factors, or let's say just not my, microbiome factors, uh, to exp explain that, number one, there is a prognostic implication, right versus left. Left-sided tumors do a lot better. And when we talk about left-sided, the transition point is probably around the, a little bit proximal of the splenic flexure. We still have some issues about the transverse colon, where that fits. Um, but left-sided tumors do a lot better than right-sided tumors, uh, independent of therapy. But then there seems to be some predictive effect that right-sided tumors, independent of RAS mutation or wild-type status, uh, do not respond to EGF septa antibody. But as you uh, outlined you know, in your presentation, which I found very intriguing, um, number one, it's embarrassing that in the era of, let's say, uh, whole exon sequencing, next generation sequencing, um, complex molecular analysis that we're talking about right versus left. And uh, I think we need to understand, are there patients who uh, go beyond just the sightedness classification? Are there uh, patients with right-sided tumors who do respond to each of septa antibody therapy? I do believe they're in there, but we need to identify them. But it, it could, go, could go into gene expression profiling, microbiome profiling, molecular profiling that we're doing anyway, methylation analysis. I mean, there are a lot of things which might not be relevant for clinical practice right now. That's why I still believe, you know, this sightedness discovery is relevant for clinical practice because it's such a cheap and easy biomarker which everyone has the moment that patients have surgery. I mean, how do you utilize the sightedness in your clinic? Oh, it's a, it's a great question. The, the uh, discussion has really changed for me. Uh, for patients uh, with first-line therapy with right-sided uh, tumors, the ones that we know there's uh, not benefit from EGFR, at least in first-line therapy, that, that really isn't part of the discussion. You know, it's a kind of a bevacizumab for appropriate patients. Uh, I do think the data uh, is compelling enough that it's at least a mandatory discussion with patients with left-sided tumors to use EGFR therapy. Yeah. And I think it, it's still worth discussing, but I will say that my, uh, my bias in many patients, especially younger and healthier ones, is to start with the EGFR unless mm -hmm. there's some, uh, some points uh, or the discussion about rash with the patient uh, is, uh, is uh, preventing that. What is your practice? I mean, I, I agree. I, so I think there's two sides of the coin. No EGF septa antibody, at least in first line therapy, we could debate why only first line, not second, third line. But clearly, the discussion has moved from, it's a Falfox bevacizumab for everyone, for left sided RAS wild type, BRAF wild type uh, uh, tumors. You know, I think EGF septa antibodies have a pretty good case for them. Um, and uh, so I could use Falfiri panitumab, cetuximab, Falfox uh, panitumab, uh, cetuximab. Um, I think we have a much better understanding uh, who to treat with EGF septa antibodies or who not to treat, but mm -hmm. refine this patient population, than identifying the subgroups of patients that might or might not benefit from anti vegf therapy. Um, so I've changed my clinical practice a little bit, moving toward um, more use of EGF septa antibodies in left sided RAS, RAF, wild type tumors. Yeah, that's uh, great points. And, and I think to the uh, to the questions that I'm sure we'll continue to get, I and mean, then you've, I'm sure, been getting as well, is, well, what does that mean for more refractory uh, <laughs> patients? Do, does this left and right-sided biology mean that even in third line, patients with right-sided tumors shouldn't get an EGFR inhibitor? Yeah, so that's actually something the NCCN had struggled with. I mean, we have a very consistent data in first line. We have some, uh, actually one study in a later line setting from the cetuximab versus best later line setting where right-sided tumors also did not show a time-related benefit. Um, now, again, we, we, on the other hand, we didn't want to preclude the usefulness or the use of EGF septa antibodies in patients who might benefit with a RAS, uh, RAF wild-type tumor in right-sided uh, patients, uh, right-sided cancers. So, uh, NCCN guidelines allow 
the use of each receptor antibodies and right sided tumors in second or third line treatment. Now, whether this makes biologic sense, whether we could have markers to identify is there a change in, uh, let's say, resistance status. And again, it's, it's just such a crude marker right now that we're really looking at forward to some more sophisticated molecular analysis that can identify who would benefit, who would not. So Dr. Hoxter had presented some data about uh, HER2 mm -hmm. uh, amplification and some of the potential there. What was your takeaway from his discussion? Yeah. So when we talk about KRAS, ALRAS, um, MSI testing, which I think is uh, mandatory for everyone, BRAF, I think the next marker relevant for not just clinical trials but clinical practice could be HER2. HER2 overexpression, HER2 amplification slash mutations, even potentially activating mutations. But let's talk about HER2 overexpression because we already have data linked to some treatment outcomes in patients who have HER2 overexpression in uh, metastatic colorectal cancer in the RAS wild type group. It's actually probably 5 to 10 percent uh, of patients. And those patients uh, with two trials actually show that using just biologics, whether it's trastuzumab plus lapatinib or trastuzumab pertuzumab, um, can have sometimes sustained responses. So it's a small subgroup of patients, but whenever we have a biomarker that is linked to some treatment outcome, I think it has a higher chance to be eventually adopted for clinical practice. Mm -hmm. Now, this biomarker is not only important for a selection of treatments, but also likely a negative resistance marker for each of septa antibodies again. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those patients with RAS wild type tumors who have HER2 overexpression, again, do not seem to respond to each of septa antibody therapy. So coming down to the point that we are slicing off the group of patients that does not respond to each of septa antibody, but those patients who are left behind, they ha there's more and more in case for them to really receive anti-EGF septa antibody first line um, because it might be a drive, it, the EGF septa might be driving biology. MAP kinase signaling mm -hmm. activation might be driving biology here. And that's why cetuximab, panitumab might be e exactly right for these patients. That's a great case for why great biomarkers make great drugs. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, uh, so in the uh, realm of, of slicing, to continue mm -hmm. on the kind of list of clinically relevant biomarkers in, in colorectal cancer, MSI. So MSI clearly uh, is defining a population where the management may be very different. And we discussed at the meeting, um, and this was not a debate because the data was so convincing, but the role of immunotherapy uh, in MSI, and, mm -hmm. uh, and there's been updates here also to the guidelines. Uh, what was your, uh, your practice changing uh, takeaway messages there? I mean, in, in the last year and a half, I think we have really uh, embraced the idea that uh, microcellulite instable or mismatch repair deficient tumors are exactly those tumors the immune system can already recognize to some degree. We just need to activate it. We just need to take the break off the immune response and we have very convincing data from various uh, studies now, whether it's with pembrolizumab, nivolumab, atezolizumab, that the hypermutated MSI high mismatch repair deficient tumors respond to single agent PD-1, PDL1 antibody therapy. So um, I think that is a no brainer. I think we're waiting for FDA confirmation of this by getting one of those drugs approved. Um, but we, they're already, the data were convincing enough to move them into guidelines. So when you look at the NCCN guidelines based on the available data we have for MSI high mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer, um, we really allow, or the NCCN guidelines allowed, uh, single agent pembolizumab, nivolumab in second or third line treatment, um, which is coupled to the idea that every patient with mismatch with colorectal cancer should have their tumor tissue tested for mismatch repair deficiency or MSI uh, status. So this is a mandatory biomarker which can give us information about some prognostic implication in earlier stage disease, can screen patients for Lynch syndrome, which I think is important, and then of course link it to immunotherapy, which has tremendous importance for patients um, with um, MSI high cancer. In stage four, which are only four to five percent, so I mean, you, you know that our quest right now is to make the 95 percent of patients that are not yet immediately responsive to immunotherapy, 
you kind of immunogenic, you know, mm -hmm. and y you know the data. I mean, you want to talk about the data that we see in MSS? Yeah, no, certainly. I think there that was certainly an area of, uh, of interest and discussion uh, at the meeting. Um, this idea that how do you deploy immunotherapy for the remainder? Um, certainly in the field right now, one of our areas of excitement is the data combining MEK inhibitors uh, with, uh, with PD-1 inhibition. And the idea here uh, being that this can help with T cell exhaustion, reactivate the T cells, and, and perhaps also modulate the tumor uh, and some of the checkpoint um, uh, and MHC expression uh, in that microenvironment. So a lot of interesting biology behind it. Uh, but the reality is that there are several patients that were seen in a uh, early phase 1B study, 20 some mm -hmm. patients, where these were microsatellite stable patients with responses to the combination. And, mm -hmm. and certainly that is enough that a, a randomized study was launched, enrollment completed, and uh, I think we're all anxious to hear uh, this result and see whether that approach uh, is one that may, uh, may turn a immune desert into yeah. a more immune active uh, subgroup. I mean, the, uh, I think we get very excited about very little data That's true. Uh, when <laughs> we really want this to be true. You know, that is the uh, same true actually for, actually where we had a debate, which was the liquid biopsy idea about minimal residual disease. I mean, is it ready for prime time? And there were some discussions about, you know, the intriguing data we've seen with highly sophisticated methodology to detect small amounts of tumor DNA fragments in circulation. Yeah, as you said, you know, really lower the detection uh, threshold by two logs, more or less compared to, let's say, imaging scans right now, and implications for adjuvant therapy. And uh, I'm actually very excited about this because I think the way we deal with patients with adjuvant therapy is pretty crude. We treat 100 patients where we know that 60 or 70 patients don't, benefit, don't need it and uh, 20 patients won't benefit when the benefit really comes down to these 10 or 5 patients sometimes depending on the stage and we have no way to identify them. So refining this patient population um, using more sophisticated measures of minimal residual disease I think is pretty intriguing. You know, and your group actually with your help is designing a clinical trial right now and I, you know, one of the things that I really liked one of my key takeaways, which I hadn't looked at this uh, really in before, was um, when we design adjuvant trials, normally adjuvant trials are large phase three trials, empiric randomization, but a, let's say, new detection technology and consequences like um, removing circulating tumor DNA with adjuvant therapy allows us to run smaller trials, phase two trials. So can you expand on that? I mean, no, I think that's, that's some of the, the hope, and so, you know, if we can really establish, as the data uh, appears to be demonstrating, that this circulating tumor DNA is a, is a strong surrogate for recurrence, and many of the studies we've seen, if it's detected that the recurrence rate is up around 100%. Yeah. Uh, now, there's certainly uh, many uh, still cases that are being missed, and so circulating DNA is not 100% sensitive. But in that setting where you can pull a population that historically you know has an incredibly high chance of recurrence, then the hope is that that allows you to do small studies uh, that can uh, evaluate more um, early uh, therapies, maybe where there wasn't as much proof of concept or there wasn't uh, as much uh, um, resources that would be needed to do that testing. And especially if you combine that with the idea of uh, perhaps not looking at the three-year recurrence rate endpoint, which is a long study, but yep. can you say, did we clear that circulating tumor DNA after our uh, experimental intervention? And that could be a necessary, albeit not sufficient, mm -hmm. a necessary step prior to kicking off a larger randomized phase three study. Yeah, though we still need to link the disappearance of circulating tumor DNA through an intervention to mm -hmm. some long-term long outcomes. So, I mean, right. in the end, it's still, because we don't just want to clear plasma, we want to make patients survive. You know? That's so right. in the end, yeah. it's, but it's a new era, I think, of how we approach uh, clinical trials in adjuvant therapy. I mean, it's, it reminds me a little bit of, you know, PET imaging as an early marker for response in mm -hmm. stage four disease. You mm -hmm. know, when you say, can we, should we switch treatments? 
And I hope that at some point we could use that also to perhaps have different types of adjuvant therapy for different tumors. You know, it's so combining the mark of minimal residual disease with some understanding about the molecular yeah, clonality of the uh, molecular alteration of the residual cancer cells that are there. We talk about stem cell inhibitors. It's um, almost impossible to design a study with a stem cell inhibitor right in stage two disease. We need thousands of patients. Mm -hmm. And it's so, it's, uh, so I'm intrigued about these things. Yeah, and I think especially where there is good therapies, good biology that makes sense for adjuvant. Yep. Right, and this idea that we need to test everything in the metastatic disease, get it approved in the metastatic before moving in the adjuvant. Well, that may not work for and stem cells. And, and it hasn't worked. And for has renutique and bevacizumab, cetuximab <laughs> has right. not worked. So we're list. still stuck with Folfox, mm -hmm. you know, and for the last more yeah, mm -hmm. 10, 11 years. You know. Yeah. Well, a lot of great technology and a lot of uh, great novel therapies, uh, but one of the sessions that we heard uh, also was on aspirin. Uh, and talking about uh, a uh, potentially clinically meaningful changes. So I thought that was a very nice session, summarized a lot of data that's been accumulating over the years. What was your takeaway from that? I mean, so I think there is no doubt that regular use of aspirin has some protective effect, especially for colorectal cancer, but it really de it depends on the duration of use. I mean, that's one of those things that earlier studies might have missed. You know, if you only take aspirin for three, even to five years, you might miss the protective um, uh, effect. Uh, so the effect really comes after fair five to 10, even longer years, but every single study that looked at it um, showed some form of uh, cancer protection. Now, there are various different mechanisms how this might uh, work, whether it's really through this uh, PF3 kinase mechanism or COX-2 mm -hmm. inhibition, um, remains to be seen. It could be also dependent on the makeup of the colon cancers, you know, because not all, ca all colon cancers are created equal. There are actually certain types that might be prevented, others might not be affected as much. Um, so interestingly, the United States Preventative Task Force has actually embraced this in 2015, and now for, pa for people, for pa patient population, over the age of 50, from 50 to 70 actually, in it, when there are some certain, in addition, cardiovascular risk factors, actually really recommends aspirin prophylaxis for colon cancer prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do believe that for a long time we overestimated the risk of bleeding, you know, uh, aspirin-related complications. Um, bottom line is when, for practical purpose, um, when I have a patient with, uh, let's say, a colon cancer, I went through adjuvant therapy, I actually sit down and have a lifestyle discussion with patients and say, you know, here, now you survived your colon cancer as much as we know, you went through your adjuvant therapy, now please help us to uh, make this cancer not come back. So, you know, uh, physical exercise, uh, normalize your body weight, uh, diet, dietary, uh, common sense uh, uh, changes, and take your aspirin. Because we have pretty solid data that in patients that had a history of colorectal cancer, that uh, secondary prophylaxis works with aspirin. So, mm -hmm. would you agree? Are you, take, are you taking aspirin now? Uh, uh, <laughs> I am, and, uh, and I recommend it uh, for all my patients after, after resection. So, very similar conversations. Yeah. Um, you know, the magnitude of benefit, it's always hard to get out of these epidemiology studies. But uh, at least the point estimates that we've seen have put this on the range of the benefits uh, that we see with oxaliplatin being exactly. added to 5-FU. And so exactly. when you sit down with a patient and say, everything you just went through for six months, you know, the, the, you know, the, the aspirin uh, at least has that, uh, that potential. And we yeah. have to be cautious when I do when I talk to patients about the, the level of data we have. But I think it's compelling and it's something that I recommend to my patients yeah, as I well. I completely agree. Yeah. So. Very good. So the, uh, uh, to get back to one of the points that we had uh, discussed earlier, this idea that, you know, as we're now doing broader testing, uh, and we, uh, I think, you know, discussed and reiterated all the important tests that we're, that we're doing as part of our workup of colon cancer, and MSI, of course, was one of those. Um, and now that that's moving into more universal testing, uh, we actually had uh, some very nice discussions at the meeting also about the, the genetic testing landscape mm -hmm. um, and thinking about how, from a genetic counseling perspective, uh, 
uh, you know, how uh, we should be managing these patients. Um, so there, certainly um, some of the same things that we've been doing for years still apply in terms mm -hmm. of looking for family history, but some interesting uh, changes in the landscapes there. Yeah, you mean there are actually genetic profile tests, molecular profiling tests on uh, tumor DNA, but also on germline DNA. And uh, so really checking off uh, kind of in a panel all these different mutations that we already know about and kind of a screening test to identify these mutations. What I'm most intrigued about are the you know, VUSs, you know, mm -hmm. some of the variants of unknown significance that we use, these genetic inf use this genetic information to really go beyond what we know. Because, you know, there's there are a lot of familial cancers where we haven't pinpointed to, okay, this is the Lynch MSI, M MLH1, whatever, um, um, alteration. Um, I think we, in an era where we can really use these genetic panels as a discovery mm -hmm. for new genetic syndromes. And I actually believe that's one of the more exciting areas of medicine because hopefully we'll develop, uh, number one, uh, uh, prevention strategies for patients. We clearly monitor these patients better when we have um, identified. It has a huge impact for a whole family, you know, family planning, et cetera. So we should not underestimate that. And it's really where medical oncology, um, translational medicine, genetics, and, uh, you know, medical, and, uh, medical genetics really uh, intersect. Yeah, it was a great, uh, great discussions uh, yeah. at the meeting. And, uh, and thank you for your great discussions uh, today uh, My pleasure. as well. So, um, so we certainly uh, heard a lot and I think had some uh, key insights from the GI debates uh, uh, meeting. And I hope that uh, at least some of these points are things that can be incorporated into the clinical practice. I think real uh, important practice changing considerations on the sightedness of uh, colorectal cancer and how one manages that. I think a lot of hope and promise around BRAF, HER2, uh, and certainly now new developments in MSI uh, that uh, are ones that we can uh, act on now in the clinic, given the new NCCN guideline uh, changes as well. So certainly an area where we're seeing a lot of, uh, of uh, promise, and I think seeing novel therapies and novel uh, technologies like liquid biopsies that may uh, make for even uh, more exciting discussions uh, in the uh, years to come. So Next thank year. you for your interest and thank you for your time.